There's a theme that we find repeated both in literature and in common experience. A small thing can create a huge problem. Just ask the little Dutch boy. He's that kid that put his finger in the hole in the dike. Why? Because that little thing could have caused a problem that would destroy his whole village, and he was a hero. Small things create big problems. Ask Jim Lovell. He was piloting the Apollo 13 mission, and that rocket performed very well except for one little tiny piece that when it was activated, it almost killed everyone. Ask the families who were part of the space shuttle Challenger explosion. Again, a rocket that was performing very well except for this one part, the O-ring. It was supposed to stop the release of gases and it didn't work. It cost them their lives. Well, there you have it. The theme that's repeated over and over again, small things create big problems. But today we're gonna to see how Jesus takes that theme and he turns it on its head. He's gonna tell about something small that creates a massive blessing. He's gonna say there is something as small as a mustard seed and that could produce everything that we actually want and we need. And so today we're going to dial into Jesus and see how he takes this grand theme and he turns it on its head and tells us how God will generate great things for you and for me. So I welcome you to Treasure Lake Church today. So glad that we can be together. Hi, I'd like to pray this morning about some of the concerns that we have in our church family. One in particular just happened recently. Um, Sam Dutry's stepson, passed away, Kurt Anderson at the age of 26 after falling off a ladder. So our hearts are, are with Sam and his family as they, they grieve the loss of Kurt. And um, Lord, there's other situations going on in our congregation that we, we know of and we'd like to bring before you this morning. So um, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, we are so grateful that we can come into your presence this morning and we're amazed at the mighty works of your hands as we look into the psalms we uh, see the magnificence of your creation and how you express your your wonders even through the way you set the stars in the heavens or god you've created such beauty around us and it's celebrated in the 19th psalm um, lord we we think of the many benefits you've given us uh, psalm 103 bless the lord O my soul and forget not any of his benefits, who heals all our diseases, who strengthens us, who saves our life from the pit. Lord, you are a great and wonderful God, and for that we are grateful. Lord, we turn our hearts before you this morning. We realize that um, sometimes we forget uh, the act of confession, confessing our sins before you. And Lord, we think of David in the 51st Psalm, where he asks that you take not your Holy Spirit from him. And, Lord, we desire, we long to be in your presence. And, Father, there's things that we've probably done that we ought not to have done and things that we've failed to do that we should have done. And, God, you know our hearts. We come before you uh, confessing our, our sins before you. And, Lord, we also want to bring before you the, the concerns of our hearts for people like the Dutry family, Lord, for the Zimitravich family who lost so heavily with uh, a, a wife and a, a mother and a mother-in-law and Lord I know they're still reeling from that from uh, others who have lost the Whitaker family who are mourning the loss of George um, Lord for Katie Hannigan who's moving away um, to St. Louis to be near her daughter and family but Lord she just lost Randy shortly before uh, moving for Ronnie Smith as she still mourns over the loss of Jimmy Lord, we ask that you be with these families who are going through grief and loss. Lord, we pray for those who are um, in recovery from various illnesses, for Jen Colop as she continues to recover from strokes, and Millie Ellen Enninger is also recovering from stroke, for Kim Robinson, who's dealing with her, her MS, for, for those who have recently had surgeries, like Bruce Nichols and Linda Brubaker and Shelley Young and Diane Lowe and and Dave Lucart, Lord, we just pray for their physical healing and, and restoration. Lord, we have families in the church who have prodigals that they're concerned about. For, for Eric and Carly, we pray that you turn their hearts toward you, that they would come home. 
Uh, we pray for Donna Oren, Lord, who has a procedure coming up at the end of this month to get his heart back into proper rhythm. We pray for strengthening of his heart for Diane Kessler, whose heart is still at a, uh, not operating at 100%. And we ask God that you, you bring her heart back to functioning properly. Lord, for Dan McMahon, who is dealing with vertigo, and pray that that would go away. Or for Mar Norma Bedford's son, who's battling cancer. Lord, there are many in our congregation who have requests that may remain unspoken, and you know their hearts, you know the needs of these people. And we ask God that uh, you minister to them during this time, that you could use us also to come alongside those who are going through difficult times too. We thank you so much for being a part of your church family, for being your children, and for the blessings that you pour out upon us. And Lord, we just ask that uh, we can express our gratitude this morning before you as we uh, spend time in praise. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord together today.
there is something in the air. Fall is upon us and with fall comes new schedules. And as you can imagine, there's new opportunities right here at Treasure Lake Church for you. We'd love for you to consider becoming part of a small group. A small group is a great way to build community, to encourage each other, and to pray for each other. And those are things that help us grow. So this September, we're kicking off small groups, and we would love for you to taste just a little bit of the inspiration that's going to be part of the small groups. So check this out. The world is in complete turmoil. We're dealing with a lot of stuff. Racism, poverty-stricken areas. Broken families. Sex trafficking. It's so violent now. Perversion. It takes everything out of God's divine order. I became very depressed. And I was going to take my life. And I said, God, I'll give you one more chance. And I said, God, please show me that you care. He went to back up a fellow officer and a group of gang members fired upon them. And Dan was hit and he died there. I didn't understand. What about all those verses where it says he will lift you up? So I was yelling out to God. As an educator, my heart is for my students. There are rules or even constraints on what I'm able to share. It's difficult to weigh the balance of what, what's appropriate. I kind of made fun of Christians. I thought they were shallow. I thought uh, religion was a crutch that people used to get through life. Life is pretty fragile. That in itself made me want to live more for Christ because I don't know how much I've got. I don't want to waste a day. I got to a place in my faith that I had to be obedient to the Lord, and I was taking a huge risk of people condemning me in my business. These are incredibly confusing times. It's as if we went to sleep and woke up in a completely different world. It leaves us, many of us, feeling confused, uh, uh, disoriented. We, we, we don't quite know how to respond to this place we find ourselves in. And yet, comes to the rescue a guy named Daniel and a book called Daniel. It was written to give instructions to adults who were living in a Babylon-like culture so we would know how to have an impact and how to have an influence. What was his secret? God is always in control of who's in control. He's never confused, he's never frustrated, he's never surprised. And therein lies the foundational cornerstone of Daniel's attitude, Daniel's action, Daniel's survival, and Daniel's thriving in Babylon. Our society is changing. There's forces that are leaning into us and those forces are getting stronger. This is a great time for us to encourage each other to stand strong in the Lord. We're gonna be having small groups that are both in person and online. So whatever format fits you the best, we think that we have something that would fit very nicely with what your needs are. So please consider becoming part of a small group. There are sign-up sheets in the foyer, and there's also a place where you can sign up online and you can show us what sort of interest that you have in small groups. We think that these five weeks are going to be a great inspiration for us, and God is going to work during this time. On September 29th, the women of Treasure Lake Church are getting together for the Reconnect Picnic. That's going to take place at Parker Dam. It's going to all start at 1130. There's going to be a picnic, time to connect, a chance to build community. You don't want to miss it. Please join the women of Treasure Lake Church at Parker Dam on the 29th. You know, this is a time in which uh, all sorts of changes are taking place for our school age kids. Fourth graders last year have become fifth graders now, and so that transition is taking place in our Sunday school program next week. So next week, Brittany will be there to help any students who are moving from one class to another make that move. That all takes place next week. And finally, I'd like to say that this has been a very important week for Treasure Lake Church as we have decided to take on a new initiative. Most of us are very aware that the education system has changed because of COVID and the pandemic. And therefore, there's a lot of kids that are just going to be at school one day and the next day they're going to be at home. And a lot of parents are wondering how in the world is that going to work? Well, we are expanding what we do here at Treasure Lake Church. We are creating a hybrid education environment where we're going to have students here when they're not in school. We're going to have instructors, facilitators that are helping them with their educational goals. And we want to be a blessing to the families of this community. I mention this for several reasons. First, I'd love for you to pray each time that we start a fairly large initiative. And for all we know, before very long, we might have another 100 to 120 kids in the building each and every week. We need your prayers as we attempt to do something new and do it well. We really want to serve the community. 
We'd also like to say that all of you who are interested in helping these children with their educational needs, well, we have need of you. There's going to be need for people who will come and help these kids with reading, people who'd be willing to sit down and read to first and second graders. There are a lot of opportunities. And if you're interested in helping with an hour, a couple hours a week, there is a place for you. So I would encourage you, if you have an interest in this, to ask a question, say that you're interested. We'll get some information to you. All you have to do is just drop us an email at Treasure Lake Church, and we will get back in touch with you with the details. Please pray for us as we seek to minister to many a family here in the area. As we go through the Gospel of Luke, we are enjoying listening to Jesus teach, and today we have come to chapter 13. And in chapter 13, he shares a story with us, the parable of the mustard seed. Let's read that parable, which we find in Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 18. We find these words. It says, And so he was saying, What is the kingdom of God like, and to what can I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and he threw into his own garden. And it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Lord, I ask that you would help us to understand your story, your words, and the power of this illustration, that your kingdom is like a mustard seed. Teach us what this means and help it to encourage us and to give us boldness. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The week that changed my life the most. You'd probably have several different candidates for what week you would choose as the one that changed you more than any other week. I have a week that comes to my mind, and what's interesting is I'm not very much in the habit of telling people the story of that week. And why is that? Although it changed my life radically, I sort of fear that when people hear the story, they might say, really? Are you serious? Isn't there something more impressive that would be the pivot point of your life? Well, I'm not sure that there is, so let me tell you the story. When I was young, I used to enjoy very much going to camp, and uh, when I went to camp, I didn't just have a good time. I met lots of people. I enjoyed them. But oftentimes, I felt like I was closer to the Lord when I went to camp. And I remember one summer as I went back to the camp that I enjoyed and appreciated so very much, Camp Judson Hills, and I was thinking, man, this year I think it's going to be a wonderful time at camp. And I did something on the very first day of that camp which I typically wouldn't have done. It never would have crossed my mind. I found myself walking by myself on a particular path out in the woods, and I spent some time on that path praying. Now, that in and of itself is a surprise for me, because during that time in my life, I was not a person who spent really any time praying. Oh, my family prayed before we had meals, and when I went to church, we would find ourselves praying there, but I just wasn't the kind of person that would choose on my own to take some time to pray. But on that day, I was walking down the path, and I ended up praying to the Lord, and without any preparation, without any forethought, I found myself saying these words, God, I'm going to give you this week of my life, and I want to see what you're going to do with it. Now, I was so surprised that I said those words. I didn't know where they came from, but having said them, I thought, why not? Why not give it a try? Why not see what God might do in me in my life because... I opened up the door to him. Well, I had one of the most enjoyable weeks of my life, and there's four things that I remember about the week. The first is this. 
I met an extraordinarily large number of people and they became my friends and I enjoyed it very, very much. I remember also that during that week I had a level of God consciousness that normally hadn't been in my mind before. When I went one place, I was thinking, this is God's week. When I went to a different activity, I was thinking, this is God's week. And I thought, I'm really going to try to do those things which would honor him. And so I was operating with a higher level of God consciousness, awareness, than normal. And then during that week, I also saw God answer three of my prayers right in front of my eyes. Now, that was surprising for me. Of course, I hadn't seen God answer my prayers before because I hadn't really prayed for anything before. But to see God answer even while I was praying was just shocking for me. And then finally, what I saw was on the very last day of camp, a student who was just my age, his name was Brian James, he came up to me and he said these words. He said, Dave, I want you to know that I can see so clearly that you are a Christian. It is so easy to see. Now, that was the very first time that I had ever heard those words. And I want you to know that I've thought about why I heard those words on that occasion, and here's what I believe to be true. I heard those words for the first time on that, at the end of that week, because that was the very first time in my life when anyone could have seen that I really was a follower of Jesus because I hadn't really been acting like it before. And so while that was a moment of triumph that someone actually saw Jesus working in me, it was also a moment of great tragedy because I had been a follower of Jesus for quite some time. And I'm not sure that it would have been very apparent to other people that I would have been his follower. And what is so interesting is that what started on a path when I simply gave God a week of my life, became a moment of transformation in which I grew and I saw things that are very, very different in my life. And I'm so thrilled that I had that week. Now, when I look back at that week, I have a couple thoughts that come to my mind. Um, up until that week, I certainly believed that God will use someone I thought that God would use impressive people, that he would use special people. I just had no idea that God actually had a plan to use me. And I was so impressed that God had that plan to use me in his kingdom. And there's also something else that I saw while I was there. I was saw that this great God who loves me so much, this great God intends to work through me, this great God can do something in my life which is worthy and this great God did all of that using something that was incredibly, incredibly simple. And that I find to be surprising. Because I want to be honest with you, I've done things that are more impressive in my life than walk along a path and say, God, please use this week, I give it to you. I mean, I'm a university grad, I have a master's degree, I've lived overseas, I've entered into various competitions. I've done things that look like, man, I really had to work and I gave it my whole heart and I, 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 I might have worked even harder than the average person. But I do not look back at those moments as the ones that truly changed my life. It was something far more simple that changed my life. And I say that introduces us to the mustard seed syndrome. It's what Jesus is talking about in this text. And what we will see is that there is a great surprise that is embedded in this thing called the mustard seed. And something which appears to be so ordinary and so simple ends up being so very, very powerful. Well, where was Jesus when he shared these thoughts? It all started on a Saturday. He was at a synagogue, and as he was at the synagogue, he was teaching and talking, and he was blessing people and creating tension. Both happened when Jesus was around. You see, he was the guy that showed up with new wine that couldn't fit into the old wineskins, and we saw it on this day. And what we saw on this day was that while Jesus was there at the synagogue, there was a woman who showed up at the synagogue, and she was a woman who had suffered for many years. For 18 years, she had been stooped over, and if there was one thing that she wanted more than anything else in her life, it was probably the ability to stand straight up and look someone in the eye and just be normal. And in compassion, Jesus reached out to that woman, and he said to her, woman, you are freed 
from your sickness. And the most amazing thing happened when he did that. When he did that, she stood up, she could look people in the eye, and people rejoiced over the great thing that God had done. Well, most people rejoiced. You see, there was somebody else there in the synagogue who was not rejoicing over this. There was a man, it was his job to take care of that synagogue, and he chose to correct Jesus, not rejoice in what Jesus had done. He said so that everybody could hear it, there are six days in which work should be done, and this is not one of those days. And so he stops to correct Jesus, the Son of God. What a fascinating thing. Jesus, with his authority, is solving a problem and showing God's love. Another man with his authority is using it just to slow down and stop Jesus. That man did not understand what the kingdom of God was all about. And because he misunderstood the kingdom of God, he did not find himself rejoicing with that woman who stood up and had a restored life. He was interested in other things. And thus, Jesus decided that he would tell a story. And that story was told, the story of the mustard seed, in order to enlighten those who had just witnessed the mistake that was made by that official of the synagogue. And Jesus thought that he could help him by telling a little story. Or I would like to paraphrase the story that Jesus told and then for us to dig in and see what is it that Christ is saying. And the story goes something like this. He says, I want you to imagine as we talk about the kingdom of God, and that will be our lesson today, I want you to imagine that the kingdom of God is like a little seed. I mean, it is a seed that is so small, you can't feel it when it's in your hand. You can hardly see it. That is what the kingdom of God is like. Now, there was a person who received that seed. It was in his hand. And when he received this seed, did he cherish it? Did he rejoice over it? Was he all excited that he had this precious seed? No, not this person. He saw in that seed about absolutely nothing, and so he decided that he would toss that seed away. He had absolutely no use for the seed, not in his garden. Now, that person did have a garden, and there were other things there that he was preoccupied with. In fact, he had come with other seeds earlier, and he had planted things. And so he had his tomatoes, and he had his carrots, and he had his beans, and he had all those things that were important to him. And that's where he put his emphasis. But no, he was not interested in this little tiny mustard seed. And to the surprise of that person, while he was taking care of the other plants in his garden, that little seed that felt like it was next to nothing, it grew and it grew until it became actually the greatest tree in the entire garden. And it was so large that when the birds of the air were looking for a place to rest, they ended up resting in this tree. Oh, sir, I want you to know such is the kingdom of of God. This is the kingdom that I am talking about. Now that story I think was rather shocking for the official to hear and there's much that needs to be said about that story. I think that we need to take a look at four observations that are easily taken from that text. Here's the observations. The first one is this. In this particular story, the seed looks incredibly un impressive. The man does not go, wow, thank you for the seed. And because the seed is unimpressive, well, the seed is disregarded by this person. He tosses it as if he has nothing to do with it. He sees no value. And this seed which is disregarded is the seed that is ultimately powerful. It will grow the largest tree of all. And therefore, this is actually a very surprising seed. It is a powerful seed. Such is the kingdom of God. Now, I think in your and my experience, we have interacted with people who sort of have demonstrated that this is a common view when it comes to the kingdom of God. I mean, you might be talking about how much you love Jesus and your connection with him and everything that the Bible means to you, and, and you might find that people are incredibly unimpressed with it. In fact, they might say, haven't you got something else to talk about? besides this and they might tend to change the subject because after all 
Will this seed make me rich? Will this seed give me the spouse that I want? Will this seed pave my career path forward? Will this seed increase my notoriety? Is this seed something that I can manipulate in order to get more of what I want in life? And the answer to all of that is no. And because that answer is no, a lot of people say, I'm not quite interested in this seed. Now, words do matter, and as we think about the words of this text, Jesus used one word and not another. In the Gospel of Luke, there is the word to plant, which Luke has already used in his text. In fact, when he talks about the parable of the sower in Luke 8, the sower goes and sows, plants the seed. And when he plants the seed, that's because he has a long-term perspective and a value that he's put in the seeds, and he wants to come back year by year, day by day, and watch those seeds grow because he sees value in those seeds. That is not the word that Jesus has used. This man that interacts with the seed, he casts the seed. And in this particular story, casting the mustard seed is actually throwing it away. And why is it being discarded? Because this person says, I don't see any value in this seed. I don't know why I would keep it. I don't know why I would look at this instead of something else. After all, it looks only as if it is some old, dried-up seed with no value whatsoever. And for many people, that's what the kingdom of God does look like, an old, dried-up seed. But we need to spend a little bit more time analyzing what is true about that seed. For when it comes to the plant, the most impressive part of the plant actually isn't the flower, although it's the most beautiful part. The most impressive part, it's not the fruit, although that is the tastiest part. The most impressive part of the plant actually is the seed, because in the seed, there is the power for one plant to generate another plant, to another generation of plants, to another generation of plants. So in each seed, there is the strength to produce 10,000 apples, 10,000 pears. The power of a plant is found within the seed. And that one little seed is everything that is necessary for the entire plant. And what we find in this story is that the power of the kingdom of God, it is often overlooked. Well, I think we understand why it's often overlooked. I think it's overlooked because we're looking for something else. And the people in Jesus' day, they were looking for something else as well. They had their hopes and desires about the kingdom of God. And if we wanted to think about what their hopes and desires were regarding the kingdom of God, they would have chosen a very different symbol rather than a little dry seed in which they would put their hopes in. I mean, the kind of hopes that they had, they were sick and tired of Rome showing up, and they wouldn't have minded for the kingdom of God to show up with the power of a tank, to show up with the raw energy that would be required to throw off the Roman legions. That's the kind of power that people were interested in in Jesus' day. And so when he shows up with just 12 followers, it looks like it's little more than just an old, dried-up seed. Now, as we think about how Jesus tells the story, one of the most interesting parts of the story is the fact that he inserts a person into the story. I mean, if he wanted to tell a story just about a seed and a garden, he didn't need to include a single individual in it. But in this story, Jesus says, I want you to watch how the kingdom of God interacts with a person. And he's telling that to the synagogue official who is off to the side. You see, this person actually ends up and has the seed in his hand. And as he has that seed in his hand, is he impressed by that seed? Is he thinking that that seed has all sorts of value? No, not this person. This person quickly discards that seed because he's in his garden and he already has things in his garden that he thinks are valuable. You see, he showed up earlier with other seeds and he planted other things. And he's going to take care of those other things, but this new little tiny mustard seed, he has no purpose for it. You see, as far as this person is concerned, his question is, uh, don't you have something else that's more impressive for me other than just that little seed? Don't you have something else that's more impressive? Well, I think that you and I, as we interact with people and as we try to tell them about our great Lord and about the kingdom of God, we oftentimes find people who have this exact same reaction. Um, Excuse me, but don't you have something that's more interesting? I mean, you start talking about things that are 
beyond the normal, that which is supernatural. You talk about the one true living God and, and you find that people end up changing the subject because they're interested in something else, not what you're talking about. They change your subject about God to talk about psychic energy or they talk about extraterrestrial life or they talk about the power that you would find in crystals or they change the subject for the good life. It's all attached to economics and a changing world in which they can succeed more. And people end up saying, I'm not very interested in those things which you are talking about. That little seed that you just brought up, it is not so impressive. And each time we bump into that response, we have encountered someone who is having a challenge with vision. What is vision? Vision often is the ability to see what others cannot see. And if someone can see what others cannot see, they have a massive advantage that could lead to life change. And in this particular story, the question is, what do people see when they see that little dried seed? I want to share two illustrations that talk about vision and how different people might have different vision. The first illustration refers to a couple of rare, very well-known companies. One might be more known today than the other. Texas Instruments and Sony. If I was to ask you what company you would like to buy most of your electronics from, I would not be surprised if you would say, I prefer something made by Sony to something that is made by Texas Instruments. But that's a very interesting place for us to be today. You see, Roll Back the Clock in Texas Instruments was one of the heavy hitters that was a competitor with IBM. And Texas Instruments, during that time, created something. They developed what is called the transistor. And that transistor took all of the guts of electronics that were part of a radio and it condensed them down into this little space of plastic and silicon and it was an amazing invention patented by Texas Instruments. But the funny thing about Texas Instruments is that they didn't really have a vision for that little transistor, but somebody else did and so they sold the rights of the transistor to Sony. And when they did that, they completely changed the destiny of Sony. For Sony began to use that transistor in a way that created an electronic revolution and an IT revolution, which led to an explosion of technological developments. And about everything that we're using today is based on some of those concepts that were found inside that transistor. You see, Texas Instruments, they took a look at that little transistor and they saw little more than plastic and silicon. But Sony, on the other hand, when they saw that little piece of plastic and silicon, Sony saw the future. And the rest for us is history. You see, one group had a vision for it and the other didn't. One saw the value that others didn't and it led to two different directions for two different companies. Vision matters. The year was 1928. It was not a good year for the medical world. In 1928, people were dying from things that we don't talk about as often today. From scarlet fever, from pneumonia, from diphtheria. These were life-threatening situations. And in order to confront these situations, there were a group of researchers who were trying to eradicate these various illnesses. And the way that they were doing that is they were actually growing the microbes and the problems in these little petri dishes. And they were taking these microbes then into the researchers so that the researchers could learn how to kill them so that we could overcome the problems of scarlet fever and pneumonia and diphtheria. But there happened to be a problem, you see, before some of the petri dishes could make it to the researchers for them to kill the microbes that were there, well, some of the petri dishes were spoiled. There was a mold that grew on top of them, and no longer were there healthy microbes there. And some of the people working in the lab were throwing away these petri dishes because they saw little value because the microbes had already died before the researchers could attack them. But one person by the name of Alexander Fleming understood that if the mold was killing the microbes, that the mold was already the solution, and the researchers didn't need to go any further. And through that discovery, what Fleming saw was not a problem for what was growing on in the Petri dishes, but it was a solution that everyone had been looking for, and this man gave us 
penicillin. You see, he had a different vision when he was looking at these two things. And what some people saw as being useless, he saw as being valuable. And today, there's not a single person who remembers any of the names of the assistants who threw away the Petri dishes. But we continue to talk about and honor the wisdom of Alexander Fleming. You see, if you have vision and can see things one way, it opens up a door for you to see things that are valuable and for it to transform your lives. But not everybody has that sort of vision. You see, there was a person by the name of Lord Calvin. And Lord Calvin was the president of the Grand Royal Society, which is a scientific entity in Great Britain. And he was responsible for what inventions would be pursued. And Lord Calvin is on record as saying, the radio has no future, heavier than air flying machines are impossible, and x-rays are a hoax. You see, all that Lord Calvin could see in those three things were just three little tiny dried up seeds. But he couldn't see that inside of those seeds was the power and the strength to generate revolutions that would change the lives of all. And on this particular day, there was a man in the synagogue who thought he understood so many things about the kingdom of God. And when he heard what Jesus said, he said, that's just a little dried up seed and I don't care about it at all. I'm interested in other things. And he was going to miss the entire boat because in that seed was everything that was necessary for a transformation to take place. And all of that raises a question. What do we see? And what is our vision? For failure to appreciate the kingdom of God is always a problem that we have with vision. For the kingdom of God is something which is fantastic. The kingdom of God is the place where God rules. It is a place where people follow him. It is a place where we say, not my will, but your will be done. And when we live in that place under his rule, there is there a power to transform the character of man. There is a power to break the bondage of sin. There is the power to relieve and set behind all addictions that plague us. There is the power not just to be married, but to have a wonderful family. There is the power not just to have kids, but to love them all the days of your life. There is the power to grow and be transformed day by day so that we are kind so that we are merciful, so that we are just, and so that we pursue those things that are right. In that little tiny seed is the kingdom, and that kingdom actually has the solution for every desire that is in our hearts. All of that is found in just a little seed. And the great surprise is this is that all of this power doesn't come to us sometime at the end of the world. Jesus says that power shows up with me Right now, the kingdom is here. And with the coming of Christ, things change and prophecies are fulfilled. You see, there were prophecies that were given about this great kingdom of God. There was a prophecy given in Ezekiel, and I think that Jesus is explaining that prophecy is fulfilled because he alludes to it in this little story. In Ezekiel, it says this, Thus says the Lord God, I will at some time in the future, I will also take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and I will set it out. I will pluck it from the topmost of its young twigs, a tender one, and I will plant it on on a high and lofty mountain. I think that right here he's talking about the coming of Christ and the coming of the new kingdom. And on that mountain of Israel, I will plant it, and it will bring forth its bows and bear its fruit and become a stately cedar. And here's the language that Jesus uses in his story. And the birds of every kind will nest under it, and they will nest in its shade and in its branches. And there is a day that's coming in which from Israel, there will be a blessing that will reach out to people from all other places. That day is coming. And Jesus says, that day is here, and that day, surprise, surprise, it is showed up through this little seed that someone didn't see the value of, and so they tossed it aside. The most important thing that they could have held on to was tossed aside. Whoever would have imagined that the power of the kingdom of God would show up in a little seed? Who could see that coming? Who could see coming the fact that in this kingdom there would be this awesome surprise 
And the surprise would be that now there is change that is happening because the kingdom has arrived and it will bring a blessing to many, many people. I think that you and I have seen some of the surprise that comes from the kingdom of God and it is a beautiful surprise when you see it. I mean, who ever could have imagined that there would have been a group of university students studying in Bucharest who would come to Christ early as they began their university career. And as university students, they would learn to love Jesus and share their faith and become the evangelists. They would take the gospel to their families and to their friends, and they would bring the light of the gospel to many, and many of them would end up traveling to places as far away as China in order that Christ would be proclaimed. Who would have ever imagined that coming? Whoever would have imagined that once upon a time there would be a campground, and at that campground there would be some people that said, let's get together and study God's word and let's sing his praise. And the people in that campground would say, well, maybe we should form a church. And so they built a little brown church on a hill here at Treasure Lake, which is the basis whereby we find ourselves gathered today. Whoever could have imagined that something so small would result in a blessing to so many? Whoever could have imagined that a woman by the name of Loretta Granger would have a meeting in her living room one day? And as a result of the meeting in her living room, there would be another church that would grow called Tri-County. Whoever could have imagined that something that would happen in a place so small, so powerless, would touch so many lives? Whoever could have imagined that one day a person would have a dream and his dream would be that there could be a new film that is made on the life of Christ and this film could be translated into every language of the world and who could have imagined that it would be this film that takes the gospel as quickly as any other tool in all of human history so that people can understand who Jesus is and what he's done for them. And who could have imagined that Simona Pallade, on the brink of divorce, would find herself watching that film when she was just at the beginning of her university years and that she would come to Christ and she would end up being somebody who leads many others to Christ. Whoever could have imagined that there would be a football coach out of Colorado who would start a movement among men called Promise Keepers that would minister to millions of people around the globe. And whoever could have imagined that just 12 little followers of Jesus would end up turning the world upside down. Whoever could have imagined all of that? Most people didn't imagine it because they didn't see the power of the seed. See, that seed is so powerful, all it needs is just some dirt to grow in, in your life and in my life. And as it grows there, it transforms everything that it touches. This is the power of the gospel and the kingdom of God. And this tells us something about our great Lord. Our great Lord surprises us, for he has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. He has taken those things which are not impressive, and he has made them impressive. And the reason why they are impressive is because in those things, he places the seed of the kingdom, and the kingdom grows, and it expands, and it blesses. The power is in the seed of the kingdom. Now, there's just a chance that you and I might need to work a little bit on our vision for the power of this little mustard seed. Because perhaps you have the ailment that I often have that I found myself feeling when I was long ago on that path, giving God a week of my life. You see, I knew that God would use someone, but I was pretty sure that he would choose to use somebody else, not me. After all, there's nothing in me that's special enough, that is unique enough in order to be used by God. But God Almighty says, it is not the fact that you are special which is critical. It is the fact that my kingdom and my hand in your life is special. And he will take that seed and he will put it in our lives and it will grow and become the largest of all of the plants that are there in the garden. And this is what is so fascinating about the story. 
You see, there was a gardener who was so concerned about other things, and he was busy about other things, and he didn't even notice that the kingdom was growing. And when the birds of the air came and they wanted a place to rest, did they land on his carrots, and did they land on his beans, and did they land on his wheat? No, they didn't land on that. But they went to something which was so much more impressive, and that is where they found rest and blessing, in the work of the kingdom of God. This seed has been given to you and me. It is growing in our lives and it is demonstrating the power of God and it will continue to surprise us because that is what the kingdom does. And therefore, those who have vision, who see the beauty in the kingdom, we say this, God, take my life Work your kingdom in my life. Transform it so that it's beautiful, so that it is a blessing to many other people. And although I be not an impressive person, do impressive things through me so that all glory will go to you. This is the mustard seed syndrome. Though it looks unimpressive, it is the most glorious thing of all. And what that synagogue official did not see on that day, you and I have the opportunity to see that the gospel is valuable, holy, and precious. May this kingdom bloom in our lives, and may we seek first this kingdom and God's righteousness so that many will be blessed. Father God, we love you very much, and we thank you for this parable. And we ask that you give us vision. We pray that we would not write off your kingdom because it looks like a little dry seed. Give us vision to see that your hand is at work and your intention is to bless many. And we pray that you would work that seed in our lives and that we would be part of this blessing for other people. Transform us by your work, by your kingdom, by your power. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So when I face the darkness, when I need to find my way, I trust in you, shepherd of my heart, keeper of this heart of mine, your patience has.
Trust in you.